elegy for Margaret. Darling of our hearts, drowning in the thick night of ultimate sea, which indeed surrounds us all, but where we are crammed islands of flesh wide with a few harvesting years disowning the bitter black severing tide. Here in this room, you are outside this room. Here in this body, your eyes drift away while the invisible vultures feed on your life. And those who read the doom of the ill-boding omen say the name of a disease which, like a villain, seizes on the pastures of your flesh, then gives you back some acres, soon again to set you on that rack of pain where the skeleton cuts through you like a knife and the weak eyes flinch with their hoping light, which, where we wait, blinds our still hoping sight. Until hope signs us to despair, what lives seems what most kills, what holds back fate seems itself fated, and the eyes that smile mirror the mocking illness that contrives, moving away some miles to ricochet at one appointed date. Least of our world, yet you are most this world today, when those who are well are those who hide in dreams painted by unfulfilled desire from hatred triumphing outside. And where the brave who live and love are hurled through waters of a flood shot through with fire, where sailors' eyes rolling on floors of seas hold in their luminous darkening irises the memory of some lost still dancing girl, the possible attainable happy peace of statued Europe with its pastures fertile, dying like a girl of a doomed hidden disease. So, to be honest, I must wear your death next to my heart where others wear their love. Indeed, it is my love, my link with life, my word of life being knowledge of such death, my dying word because of you can live, crowned with your death, this life upon my breath. From a tree choked by ivy, rotted by kidney-shaped fungus on the bark, out of a topmost branch, a spray of leaves is seen that shoots against the ice-cold sky its mark. The dying tree still has the strength to launch the drained life of the sap into that upward arrowing glance above the strangling cords of evergreen. So with you, Margaret, where you are lying, the tree trunk of your limbs choked back by what destroys you. Yet above the sad grey flesh, what smile surmounts your dying on the peak of your gaze? How tediously time kills, while the difficult breath asserts one usual laughing word above this languor of death. Like a water clock, it fills the hollow well of bones, drop by drop with dying. Yet all that life we knew, the eyes hold still. How, when you have died, shall we remember to forget, and with knives to separate, this life from this death? Since, Margaret, there's never a night but the beflagged pride of your youth in all its joy does not float upon my sleep as on a boat. Poor girl, inhabitant of a stark land where death covers your gaze, as though the full moon might cast over the midsummer blaze its bright and dead white pall of night. 
poor girl, you wear your summer dress and black shoes striped with gold, as today its variegated cover of feathery grass and spangling flowers, delineating colour over shadows within which bells are told. I look into your sunk eyes, shafts of wells to both our hearts, which cannot take part in the lies of acting these gay parts. And our lips, our minds become one with the weeping of that mortality which through sleep is unsleeping. Of what use is my weeping? It does not carry a surgeon's knife to cut the wrongly multiplying cells at the root of your life. All it can prove is that extremes of love reach the arctic pole of the white bone where panic fills the night in which we are alone. Yet my grief for you is myself a dream tomorrow's light will sweep away. It does not wake day after day to the same facts that are and do not seem, the changeless changing facts around your bed, poverty-stricken, hopeless ugliness of the fact that you will soon be dead. Already you are beginning to become fallen tree trunk with sun-sculptured limbs, in a perspective of dead branches and dry bones, encircled by encroaching monumental stones. Those that begin to cease to be your eyes are flowers whose petals fade and honey dries, crowded over with end-of-summer butterflies. Wings gather to night's thickening memories. Peacock, red admiral, fritillaries, fly to your eyes and then fly from our gaze. Against the wall, you are already partly ghost, whispering, scratching existence, almost lost to our vulgar, blatant life that eats through rooms our vulgar, blatant life, like heaped-up, transient blooms. You are so quiet, your hand on the sheet seems a mouse. Yet when we turn away, the flails that pound and beat you down with ceaseless pulse shake like steam hammers through the house. Evening brings the opening of the windows. Now your last sunset throws shadows from the roots of trees, thrusting hounds it unleashes. In the sky fades the cinder of a rose. Eumenides strain forwards. The pack of night stretches towards us. The final act of love is not of dear and dear, blue bird shall I, pink sea shall ear, dove twining neck with dove. Oh no, it is the world storm fruit, sperm of tangling distress, mouth raging in the wilderness, fingernail tearing a dry root. The deprived fanatic lover, naked in the desert of all except his heart, in his abandon must cover with wild lips and torn hands, with blanket made from his own hair, with comfort made from his despair, the sexless corpse laid in the sands. He pursues that narrow path where the cheek leads to the skull, and the skull into spaces full of lilies and death. Dazed, he finds himself among saints who slept with hideous sins, whose tongues take root on ruins, 
and their language fills his tongue. How far we travelled, sweetheart, since that day when first we chose each other as each other's rose, and put all other men apart. Now we assume this coarseness of loved and loving bone, where all are all and all alone, and to love means to bless everything and everyone. Dearest and nearest brother, no word can turn to day the freezing night of silence where all your dawns delay watching flesh of your Margaret wither in sickness away. Yet those we lose we learn with singleness to love. Regret stronger than passion holds her the times remove. All those past doubts of life, her death, one happiness does prove. Better in death to know the happiness we lose than die in life in meaningless misery of those who lie beside chosen companions they never chose. Orpheus, maker of music, clasped his pale bride upon that terrible river of those who have died. Then of his poems the uttermost laurel sprang from his side. When your red eyes follow her body dazed and hurt under the torrid mirage of delirious desert, her breasts break with white lilies, her eyes with Margaret. I bring no consolation of the weeping shower whose final dropping jewel deletes all grief in the sun's power. You must watch the signs grow worse day after day, hour after hour. Yet to accept the worst is finally to revive when we are equal with the force of that with which we strive, and having almost lost at last are glad to be alive, as she will live who candlelit floats upon her final breath, the ceiling of the frosty night and her high room beneath, wearing not like destruction but like a white dress her death.